Once it was so simple. Nearly everyone believed that the core of human existence was an immortal soul given to us by God. But that belief has wavered in the bright light of reason and we are left adrift, uncertain how to describe that niggling feeling that there is more to life than the sum of our fleeting time. There has been an increasing embarrassment about engaging with this notion of seldom, but it does fly in the face of experience. So to rule it out of court altogether or simply to kind of resign from it and say we can't speak about this anymore would seem to me a kind of failure of human nerve. What has survived, even in a soulless world, is an overwhelming sense that, quite separate from the doing and the talking of the material self, there is a quieter place inside our head, a place beyond reason and calculation, from which inspiration and insight come. The normal rational view of how the mind works is that the mind is mathematical, the thinking is logical. I mean, I love reasoning and logic, I'm a mathematician, but, but in a way, mathematics is finally forced to confront its own limitations and is even underlining and proving that there has to be more there. But the nature of whatever it is that lies beyond logic has been impossible to locate or define. As a result, many scientists of the mind believe that the essence of our self is the rational part of our brain alone. But for others, the soul remains worth searching for. There's a good reason we have these two words, self and soul. And there clearly are two different kinds of processes which feel very differently to us introspectively. On the one hand, we have the self which uses language and thinks rationally. And on the other hand, we have these moments of insight, creativity, and they feel completely different. There is nothing scientifically useful that can be said about the soul after death. But the soul of the living is another matter. And the search for that is gathering pace. I think the key thing about the self is that it can be a very circumscribed phenomenon and I think it's essential to the idea of the soul that it is not in that way circumscribed. The self in modern life can often be simply an aggregate of present wishes and desires and conscious plans and can see itself as a functional unit in a, in a, in a very functional world and I think people have been deceived into thinking that because we are able to understand certain things quite practically for certain purposes so that we can exploit them, we can understand them using a very simple model, a mechanistic model which is the worst kind of scientific model, that ourselves should follow this pattern. But whether we like it or not, our materialistic and scientific culture has whittled away at our sense of having an inner core to who and what we are. Ultimately, there are circuits. That's the assumption of neuroscience. There is a circuit in there that finds you, the self, always asking the question, why did I do that? What's the meaning of this? It's constantly trying to seek patterns, seek understanding towards our actual behavior, felt states, and all the rest. It's trying to tell a story that's consistent with what's going on. And that becomes the narrative. That becomes the self-story of who we are and what we're doing and how we're interacting throughout life. So the self, says Gazaniga, is like a computer chip tucked away inside our brain, making sense of the confusion of our neural experiences. That chip, that interpreter chip, that little wiring is in our left hemisphere. I think the subtleties of the human condition in terms of thought and rationality are all left hemisphere based events. It is the thinking, language based, hypothesis generating hemisphere. It is the one that does the heavy lifting for our cognitive life. 
It was this sort of reductionism that prompted Ian McGilchrist to study psychiatry. He agreed that the interpreter exists, but believes it is only part of our essence. Gazanig has written about the interpreter and produced some very interesting evidence, which he interprets, it seems to me, in a way that isn't justified by the evidence. He sees it, this interpreter, as being the, the thing that is actually us and is our, our consciousness. <coughs> and it is, for certain purposes, what rules the roost. But it isn't the whole of the self at all. The two hemispheres have evolved to capture a different model, if you like, of the world, to capture a different aspect of existence. And they both have realities that they can show us. The left hemisphere tends to see a thing as bits of things that don't necessarily cohere at all and is most at home, actually, with things that present themselves as rather novel lumps of little bits. Whereas the right hemisphere has more of a gestalt feel of things. It sees things in the whole, rather than simply as parts. It sees things in context. For example, if I say to you, it's rather hot in here, you understand that what I mean is, could you please open the window? That level of understanding of language is what goes on in the right hemisphere. It understands what people mean when they say things, taking into account everything we know. Whereas the left hemisphere is still busy looking words up in the dictionary and putting them together using, that's a bit of a, 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 um, a generalization, but that is the, the general idea. It's not just language, it's everything that we do. The left brain on its own, left to its own devices, it's like one of those people that you ask directions, they don't know the directions, they're damned they're going to say they don't know the directions, they'd rather tell you to go somewhere else and save the face than actually helpfully say I don't really know, but it's not in the vocabulary of the left hemisphere, I don't really know. What I'm trying to suggest is that this interpreter in the left hemisphere is a bit of a jumped up individual who has, if you like, taken upon himself to say that this is what the world is, this is the way the world is. Whereas in fact our bodies, our emotions, things that are outside of our consciousness, and so will quickly tell us that that isn't all that there is. Once it was in monasteries, not hospitals or labs, where people sought answers to questions of this sort about our mind and our being. The method for such investigation then was prayer. And even in the modern world, pockets of such inquiries still exist. A lot of prayer is a question of gathering myself back together again. You are trying to focus your attention on awareness and focusing then a little bit on the you that is aware. Now for me this is the well, let us call it the soul. Augustine, in the Confessions, talks about this return into oneself and an awareness of a light above the mind, as it were, which gives a sense for him of God's presence to the mind. But for me, the interesting thing is it's by the light of that presence, he is aware of anything that is. Um, awareness is something which is, if you like, metaphysically prior to that of which I am aware. So in the language of religious experience as well, there are two distinct parts to us. They also believe, behind the busy rational self, there is something else, without which the self cannot exist. The paradox is that it's impossible to see this essential soul directly. We can only sense its presence from what it illuminates. <laughs>